It all started in the year 1928, when Paul Dirac united the Schrödinger equation, which describes the evolution of quantum wave functions, with Einstein's theory of special relativity. The Dirac equation describes the movement of an electron at any speed, even approaching the speed of light. But the equation has a surprising property that nobody was really expecting. The electron is just one of two possible solutions. Now, how is that possible? Well, it's actually pretty common in mathematics. It happens, for example, in what we call the quadratic equation. x times x equals, let's say, 4. Or, in other words, x squared, which is why we call it the quadratic equation, equals 4, right? This is the same thing. So what number multiplied by itself gives 4? Well, of course, 2. Hold on. But that's not the only possibility, right? Minus 2 is just as good. So, in fact, this equation has two possible solutions. Now, if we write down the, the, the Dirac equation, this has two solutions. One of them is our old friend, the electron. But it has a second solution, which is kind of like an electron with negative energy. What could that be? The physical interpretation of this second solution was unclear at first. But then, four years later, in 1932, Carl Anderson discovered the positron. And physicists quickly realized that this was the missing other solution to Dirac's equation. A particle, pretty much identical to the electron, but with positive instead of negative electrical charge, the anti-electron. After that, 22 years had to pass before another antiparticle was found, the antiproton. A particle identical to the proton, but negatively charged. Today we know that every particle of matter has its corresponding antiparticle, which is like its twin copy, but with opposite electrical charge. But what about particles with zero charge then? For example, what about the neutron? Well, the neutron also has an antimatter counterpart, the antineutron. That's because the neutron, like the proton, is made of three quarks, and the antineutron, like the antiproton, is made of three antiquarks. Protons and neutrons are composite particles, but if you look at the elementary particles of matter that we know today, quarks and leptons, they all have antiparticles. There's quarks and there's antiquarks, leptons and antileptons. We already talked about the anti-electron, the positron, but also neutrinos that have no electrical charge have antiparticles. For every neutrino, there's an antineutrino, and the two are not the same particle. But it is actually possible for particles to be their own antiparticles. The photon is an example of this. This doesn't happen for elementary quarks and leptons, but it can happen for composite particles. Example? the J-Psi meson, a state containing one charm quark and one charm antiquark. So the antiparticle of this would be one charm antiquark and one charm quark, so the exact same thing. So the anti-J-Psi is the J-Psi. Okay, that's particles and antiparticles. So now the question is, what about more complex systems? Can antiparticles form antimatter? Yes, they can. If you take an anti-electron, and an antiproton, you can form a bound state, antihydrogen. And this was done for the first time in 1995, right here at CERN, in the Low Energy Antiproton Ring Facility, or LIR for short, where over the period of three weeks, nine atoms of antihydrogen were produced. Now, in a similar way, you can take antiprotons, antielectrons, and antineutrons to make any chemical element out of antimatter, in fact, any form of matter. So stars, planets, galaxies, for all we know, even life itself could be made out of antimatter and would look just the same as the stuff made out of matter. So maybe we have antimatter here on Earth. Well, we know we don't. And we know it's not possible. Why? That's because when matter and antimatter come into contact with each other, they annihilate. 
So let's talk about this for now. Chances are that one of the first things that comes to your mind when you hear the word antimatter is annihilation. Matter and antimatter annihilate when they touch, disappearing in the process and releasing insane amounts of energy. So let's talk about the physics of this process. What can annihilate with what? And in what situation? What exactly happens and what kind of energy is released? And can we maybe use this for something? Okay, so what is annihilation really? Why do matter and antimatter annihilate in the first place? Well, this goes back all the way to one of the most fundamental laws of physics that says that nature always prefers states with less potential energy. And if it finds a way to go from a state with higher energy to one with lower energy, it'll do that. For example, let's look at the electron. Even if it's not moving, it still has energy because it has mass. So the energy of the electron is the mass of the electron times the speed of light times the speed of light. Now, nature would be happy to go to a state with less mass, like the neutrino or the photon, but it cannot because the law of conservation of electrical charge forbids that. Electrical charge cannot change in, a, in an interaction, and here it would have to, because the electron has charge and the neutrino and the photon don't. There is no other charged particle lighter than the electron, so the electron cannot by itself decay or transform into another particle, and as far as we can tell, the electron is stable. Unless it interacts with something, an electron is going to forever remain an electron. So now let's imagine we have two particles, an electron and a positron, which is how we call an anti-electron. So the total charge of this pair is now zero. And the process where the two transform into photons is actually allowed. It has to be two or more photons due to other conservation laws, but in general, nature will take the opportunity to go from two electron masses to zero mass anytime it can. And we call this process electron-positron annihilation. In this process, all of the energy of the electron and positron masses is converted into the energies of the photons. With a very small chance, entirely at random, a neutrino-antineutrino pair can be produced instead. And if the electron and the positron are moving very fast, there is also their kinetic energy available. With more energy, heavier particles can be created, such as a muon-antimuon pair, or a z-boson, or something else. This is how electron-positron colliders work, transforming the kinetic energy of the electron and the positron into new particles. What's also interesting is that, in some cases, an electron and a positron, instead of annihilating, can form a bound state called positronium, in which the two particles are essentially orbiting each other. Depending on how their spins are oriented, this system has a lifetime of about one-tenth of a nanosecond, or a bit more than a hundred nanoseconds, and nanosecond being one billionth of a second. And only after that time, the pair will annihilate, producing several photons. Okay, so that's the electron. What about the proton? Well, a proton can annihilate with an antiproton. The process is actually quite complicated as all the quarks and antiquarks interact. At the end, several light particles made of quark-antiquark -quark pairs, that we call pions, are usually produced. In a similar way, a neutron can annihilate with an antineutron. But can a proton annihilate with an antineutron? Yes, it can. Since this is again going to be quarks and antiquarks interacting, just that as opposed to proton antiproton or neutron antineutron annihilation, this time the charges of the pions produced will add up to one, not zero, to match the total charge of the proton antineutron pair. So then, can any matter particle annihilate with any antimatter particle? Can a proton annihilate with an anti-electron? Well, no. These are fundamentally different types of particles, and there are several conservation laws that forbid such a process. So basically, if you just mix 
protons and positrons, nothing would really happen. But of course, matter in general contains all of these. Protons, neutrons and electrons. So if you somehow got hold of a gram of antimatter and mix that with a gram of matter, all the protons, electrons, anti-electrons, anti-protons, all of the others would indeed annihilate in a very energetic flash of photons, pions, muons and other particles. And the amount of energy released in this process would be enough to take an engineer from CERN on a mission to the International Space Station about 30 or 40 times. In the annihilation process, nearly 100% of mass is converted into energy. I'm saying nearly 100 because some of the particles produced are actually massive. So a small amount of leftover mass still remains. But this is still almost 100 times more efficient than nuclear fusion. So could this be the ideal energy source? Well, we'd first have to figure out a way to make the products of annihilation, mostly high energy gamma radiation, to make them do something useful. But also, where do we find a gram of antimatter? Maybe here. This is the CERN Antimatter Factory, home to several experiments studying the properties of antimatter. We'll talk about these experiments and their studies in a later episode. But for now, let's just focus on the factory bit, producing antimatter. So producing antimatter is actually incredibly complicated and uses tremendous amounts of energy. In fact, to produce antimatter, you need billions of times more energy than what would be released if that antimatter were to annihilate. And then if you produce it, you have to store it somehow, trapped, suspended in vacuum, away from all the ordinary matter around it, because if it touches ordinary matter, it would, of course, annihilate. The current record for holding trapped antimatter is 614 days, achieved right here in the base experiment for a few single antiprotons held in a trap. But for holding large quantities of antimatter, using a plasma of charged antiprotons is not very practical. So we could try with antiatoms. Now, the only antiatom that we know how to produce is antihydrogen. We produce antihydrogen in a few places around the antimatter factory. So in terms of storing antihydrogen, the current leader is the alpha experiment right here, which can produce antihydrogen and then store it for up to about 100 hours. But how much antihydrogen can we realistically produce? Experiments in the antimatter factory get up to 10 million antiprotons every two minutes and catch about one tenth of that, about 30 million antiprotons per hour. Alpha then converts them to antihydrogen, but can only capture about 3,000 atoms per hour. How many atoms are there in one gram of antihydrogen? About 6 times 10 to the 23rd. That's six and 23 zeros. So the time needed to accumulate a gram of antihydrogen at these speeds would be billions of billions of years. Even if we converted all the antiprotons to antihydrogen and caught all the antihydrogen, which is completely unrealistic, we'd still need hundreds of billions of years, much, much more than the age of the universe. So unless we discover some new physics phenomena, we're not going to be able to fabricate any macroscopic quantities of antimatter. But what if we look for it in space instead? Mine it on anti-planets, bring it back home as an energy source? Well, strangely enough, it seems that there are no anti-planets in the universe. In fact, the universe appears to contain almost no antimatter whatsoever. Understanding why this is the case is one of the biggest puzzles in physics today. Why this is a puzzle and how we are trying to solve it, coming up in episode two. <laughs>